Guten Morgen, guten Tag, guten Abend. Let's together discuss the water cycle of the Mekong Basin as well as different future scenarios. The Mekong Basin is located in Southeast and East Asia, going through Tibet, China, Myanmar, Laos, Thailand, Cambodia, and Vietnam. Right now we're looking at a map of precipitation, that is rainfall and snowfall over the Mekong Basin, areas that are white or transparent, have less precipitation than areas that are dark blue, and this will change as we move forward into the map. Now, running precipitation through a hydrological model, as well as other climate variables historically, we can evaluate what evapotranspiration over the Mekong Basin can look like. Evapotranspiration is the water that evaporates or transpires over soils or through crops. So the water that evaporates from wet soils or the water that gets absorbed by roots passes through the plants and leaves the leaves through the stomata of plants. So water used by plants like forests, wetlands, agriculture, as well as water that is evaporated from wet soils. So this is evaporation, again a density map evapotranspiration over the Mekong Basin. Areas that are darker or less transparent have higher values than those. Uh, areas that are transparent or light have lower values than areas that are dark. So we see here at the bottom, at the delta in Vietnam, we have a relatively high amount of evapotranspiration. One last map to look at, the map of discharge, which is the amount of water flowing through the rivers. Again, this is simulated with the hydrological model CWAT-M at 30 arc minute resolution. We're looking at it from the delta, so the opposite way that the water, the water is traveling towards us. We are seeing the main line of the Mekong River and the Mekong Basin. All right, what does the water cycle look like through the Mekong Basin? So of all the inputs, it is mostly rain, but we see uh, a shadow of snow. Good. So less than 1% of the precipitation falling over the Mekong Basin is snow. Again, this is going to change year to year. This is just using a, an average over a few years. The main output from the basin is evapotranspiration. So of all the rainfall, or generally all the precipitation falling onto the basin, most of it is leaving the basin through the plants or through wet soils, evaporating, transpiring, transforming from liquid water into vapor. So basically this map. But a substantial amount of water also leaves the basin. We see downstream, which stands for the amount of water flowing through the river and eventually leading into the ocean. So the amount of water flowing out of the Mekong Basin into the ocean. This will change year to year. If I come over to this website, globalwaterbalance.herokuapp.com, and look for the Mekong Basin, click the Mekong Basin. All right, we see at the top it says 1971. So in 1971, it was a, a split between around 40, 60% river discharge evapotranspiration, if I choose 2011. So the the relative amount uh, is fluctuating, but we see generally that all the precipitation is falling mostly as evapotranspiration, but still significantly as water flowing out of the basin into the ocean. One thing to focus on is the seasonality of the water cycle. What we're focusing on here are the inflows and outflows. The blue represents the inflow, so precipitation, mostly rainfall, and the red is representing the outflows, which is both evapotranspiration and discharge out of the basin. We see with precipitation inflows, there is a striking seasonality. There are definitely periods of wetness and periods of dryness, and there are peaks generally with both. We see the peak is perhaps uh, from June to let's say September, and we see almost no rainfall from December to March. We are looking at two years here. 
So we see two very clear cycles for the inflows and the outflows, although the outflows are a dampened, smoothened version of the more punctuated, sharp inflows. So it dampens the evapotranspiration and discharge, dampen the outflow from the basin. Let's go into the future. So these are future scenarios based on different representative concentration pathway uh, scenarios. They represent different concentrations of greenhouse gas emissions within the atmosphere, how this might affect the climate, and different models built on these assumptions are, are simulated to see what could be the different peak precipitation or uh, valleys in precipitation. So we see here from 1900 to 2020, the historical precipitation in the Mekong Basin. Just to be clear, this would be zero precipitation. So this, we see a significant fluctuation from uh, within the years from 1900 to 2020, uh, perhaps even decadal seasonality. And when we look into the future scenarios, again, these are just scenarios to test the a reasonable range of what might be possible. I wouldn't bet on any of them, but they do allow us to test a range of scenarios, particularly test current infrastructure and development plans against these scenarios to see how they may benefit from or be challenged by these increases or decreases in annual precipitation. To give a more um, similar comparison, let's compare 30 years to 30 years. So let's go from 1990 to 2050. So we see this example coming up in 2038, 36. Let's, again, not bet on any of these. These are just scenarios to test with. We see that the scenarios suggest more precipitation than ever fell before or ever fell within the last century. We also see periods of annual precipitation lower than has ever been experienced within the last century. Of course, as we already noted, the spatial variability of precipitation across the Dan across the Mekong Basin uh, is heterogeneous. So although there might be years of wetness, years of dryness, uh, hydrologic anomalies, this will be experienced very differently across the basin. And years of wetness may also have parts of the basin experiencing uh, striking dryness. Here's another way of looking at this. Yeah, each point within the historical represents a year of precipitation from 1900 to 2020. And the dots within the three different scenarios, they represent different uh, representative concentration pathway scenarios and five different models for each of these scenarios. We see that there are points that are significantly higher than has ever been experienced within this last century, as well as points that are significantly lower. So what one might be able to conclude is that the range of variability may widen moving into the future up to 2050, as well as the occurrence of extreme years may become, um, uh, may occur more often. Again, just to be clear, this isn't hitting zero, but let's take this down to zero. So the range of variability seems somewhat less, less striking. What is also interesting is to discuss how socioeconomic changes may affect water use in the basin. In other basins, it's often seen that industrial or domestic demand is going to significantly increase, but the Mekong Basin is dominated by irrigation water use. These scenarios are not showing any increases in irrigation. Changes in irrigation, the amount of water used on irrigated lands, or even the amount of irrigated lands, will probably change into the future. But this simply shows how the demands will change simply if we keep the irrigated area constant, will change according to different climate scenarios. So we see there will be demands higher than anything that happened historically, as well as, as potentially uh, lower given the, after the significant increase. But if we look at domestic and industrial demand, which are somehow dampened by the striking irrigation demands, we do see domestic and industrial demands both increasing. All right, how can the Mekong Basin prepare for climatic variability that may increase the occurrence of extremes as well as widen the idea of extremes, as well as experience increasing domestic and industrial demands 
amidst a landscape of significant irrigation water use. Solutions encouraging community-based management at the same time basin-wide uh, water management as well as green infrastructure and nature-based solutions are the priority. Good luck.